Hello and thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you today about aural diversity. My name's Andrew Hugill and I'm currently the Deputy Director of the Institute for Digital Culture at the University of Leicester. My background is in music. I'm a composer and a musicologist and a professor of music. People may be familiar with my book, The Digital Musician. And then in more recent years, I've moved into creative computing and creative technologies for reasons that will become apparent later. So what is aural diversity? Well, you'll notice that I pronounce the word aural rather than oral. This is to avoid confusion with O-R-A-L. It relates to hearing, of course. And it comes from a very simple observation that everybody hears differently. And this is just a fact. Our ears are uniquely shaped to each of us, and that affects the sound that we hear. And of course, we all develop in different ways during the course of our lifetimes, and our hearing changes and evolves, sometimes on a temporary basis, sometimes on a more long-term basis. Everybody's hearing is different. The surprising thing is that that simple fact is overlooked most of the time in disciplines that uh, concern themselves with hearing and listening. One key question that we raise and which we use to challenge received wisdom is whose ear has primacy? When one reads in the literature about the human ear and about hearing and about listening, the question in my mind always is whose ears are we talking about? The phrase oral diversity was coined in 2018 by John Levac Drever, um, and he used the term oral diversity, all one word, as a kind of echo of neurodiversity to distinguish between normal hearing, which was defined by a British standard from 2003 as that of a healthy 18 to 25 year old, to distinguish between that and atypical hearing. Now, if you really want to get into depth in this topic, uh, then we've published a book last year, Aural Diversity, which contains many interesting essays exploring many different facets of hearing difference. So do go and read the book. According to all the textbooks, human auditory perception is defined by a threshold of audibility between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz at zero dBA. And within that, there's a threshold of discomfort, which is at 110 dBA, and pain at around about 130 to 140 dBA. A dBA here refers to A-weighted decibels. This uses a logarithmic scale to reflect the standard variations in hearing acuity. There are other ways of measuring decibels, uh, C-weighted decibels, for example, are flatter in frequency response and they do reflect better how the ear responds to very loud sounds. But this is the basis of acoustics, the basis of acoustical measurement and our understanding of human auditory perception. And it's a kind of one-size-fits-all acoustic metric. And this is typified by the International Standards Organization's equal loudness level contours known as uh, fletcher munson curves. Now these curves were defined initially by Harvey Fletcher in the Bell Labs in the 1930s uh, and there were subsequent experiments which uh, reinforced them. In, in these experiments tones are presented in groups of two an octave apart projected directly in front of the listener in an anechoic chamber and the levels are adjusted until the listener perceives both as equally loud. And then this is repeated with another pair of frequencies until a frequency spectrum from 20 hertz to 12.500 hertz is mapped out. The register of these adjustments across this spectrum are plotted, providing an account of the listener's hearing acuity with regards to a given frequency and its perceived loudness related to its sound pressure level. But who are these listeners? The chart presented in the standard is a statistical blend of data from 12 studies from 1983 to 2002 
based on subjects aged around 18 to 25 years old. And so this becomes the age group stipulated in the standard. Moreover, these listeners had to be, quotes, otologically normal. So they called it a, a person in a, a normal state of health who is free from all signs or symptoms of ear disease and from obstructing wax in the ear canals and who has no history of undue exposure to noise, exposure to potentially ototoxic drugs or familial hearing loss. Now, this group is very small. This is roughly 17% of the population. So now let's set out the full scope of oral diversity and look at hearing differences in all their aspects. Now, this infographic I produced last year in collaboration with the Aral Diversity Network. And you'll see that it divides up in, into coloured regions. Let's consider, first of all, the region in blue at the bottom of the uh, image. This is the progression of most people's hearing. That's to say what the International Standards Organization would call normal hearing. Hearing in the womb is something that has been much studied recently. And what's clear is that the, the hearing system is active, but it is fundamentally different from even infant hearing and certainly from teenage or young adult hearing. Infant hearing after birth takes about six months to develop to the point that you can fully hear and understand a range of sounds. And from then really until your early 20s, this is the area that is commonly defined as normal. So our notion of what constitutes normal hearing is based on a very small subset of the entire population. And I think a central argument of the Aral Diversity Project is that that is too small a group by which to set any kind of standard. In what sense is this normal? Once you get past the age of 21, roughly, sometimes a little later, sometimes a little earlier, your hearing starts to change. And what typically happens is that you lose the higher frequencies so gradually there's a progressive decline of hearing acuity in the higher frequencies. And this is called presbycusis or age-related hearing loss. Now the rate of deterioration through life does vary from person to person, but male hearing typically declines at twice the rate of female hearing. And of course, it can be affected by external factors like environmental factors and by medical conditions. So you don't really notice it until you get perhaps into your mid 40s often, and then you start to have difficulty understanding certain words and phrases, often in crowded situations, noisy environments, particularly sounds like pfft are difficult to pick out and you end up asking people to repeat themselves or raising volume levels. This is, this is common to everybody so I would guess that most people listening to this have had some experience of age-related hearing loss. Normally it's, it's fairly mild until you get to old age, you know, perhaps in your late 60s, 70s and certainly 80s when often there's the need for a hearing aid to correct this age-related hearing loss. So that is a, a summary of the pattern of a typical person's hearing and this applies to around about five-sixths of the po population of the world. The other one-sixth are people who have some kind of medically diagnosable hearing difference. Now, you'll notice I use the word difference here. In medical terms, you'd say impairment, loss, disorder, disability. But in the Aral Diversity Project, we like to avoid those kinds of pathologizing terms if we can. 
so these one in six people are typically classified on an audiometric scale from profound deafness to mild hearing loss. We should remember that the deaf community divide into those who communicate primarily through sign language and those who do not sign uh, and may hear through interpretation. And that this kind of hearing loss may be present from birth or acquired in one or both ears. But it's important also to notice that not all forms of hearing difference involve loss. So let's explore this diagram a bit more. About 90% of all hearing difference is sensory neural in nature. So uh, this is the left area of the diagram. And this affects the inner ear in one way or, or the uh, acoustic nerve in one way or another. So we have genetic differences that are inherited but not necessarily present from birth, which can be caused by uh, mutation of genes. Or congenital differences that are present from birth and may be hereditary or caused by drugs or viruses or syndromes. And then things like acoustic shock, a disease, autotoxic damage caused by drugs or noise induced damage or loss caused by a, a brief intense sound or continuous exposure to loud sounds. And I guess those that one is the one that's probably best known certainly in musical circles because musicians are disproportionately affected by noise induced hearing loss. There's also auditory neuropathy where the ear is detecting sound but can't pass it to the brain for whatever reason. And then on the other side we have conductive hearing loss. This relates to blockage, some kind of uh, problem sending sound waves through the ear. So this is a, a physical thing. So you can have temporary blockages such as wax or fluid in the ear. Or you can have more permanent ones such as abnormal bone growth, tumours um, and so on. A narrow canal, some people are born with a narrow canal. And then there are conductive issues of the inner ear that are specific medical conditions like superior canal dehiscence for example or labyrinthine fistula which are basically objects or disorders or growths in the ear. And then there are inflammations that can be caused by viral, bacterial or fungal infections allergies, drugs again, eustachian tube di dysfunction, and uh, barotrauma, which is where you have unequal pressure between the external and the middle ear, which you typically experience, you know, for example, on a flight when your ears pop. Uh, I expect everybody's familiar with that phenomenon. So those are the two conditions that audiologists typically see and work with. But there's a third area that I've called the auditory system, and this relates to neurological issues with sound, so neurological in hearing. So here it's not necessarily the case that there's any damage to the ear as such, or the hearing mechanism. This is more about how the brain processes sound. For example, we could look at neurodivergence, so autistic listening, the way autistic people hear, often having a heightened sound perception or an ability to focus on detail. And then a couple of diagnoses that have really come into uh, prominence in recent years, hyperacusis and misophonia. Hyperacusis is an increased sensitivity to sound, so even quite quiet sounds by uh, most people's standards become really painful to listen to. Misophonia is somewhat different. This is not so much about the loudness of sounds, it's about a negative emotional reaction to a sound. So you may feel an intense disgust, for example, by someone chewing or by some other sound that people make. It's often people that cause the problem for, for misophonics. Then there's something called auditory processing disorder where the hearing is completely normal but the brain can't understand what it hears. That's a pretty rare condition but it does happen. And then phonophobia which is a fear of spe certain specific sounds and is a, is a phobia and hallucinations 
which uh, may be musical. So you, you can hear music when there is no music playing. You can also hear voices and hear other sounds that are, are not present. A palaninocusis, where a sound appears to repeat even though it can no longer be heard. And diplocusis, which is about perceiving pitch difference between the two ears. I'll come back to that one. Now, all of these conditions, the sensory neural, the conductive, combinations of sensory neural and conductive and auditory system, are all causes of tinnitus. And tinnitus is such a common phenomenon that I'd be surprised if most people in the audience are not familiar with it. Either they've experienced it or they know people who've experienced it or they've heard about it. But basically, tinnitus is, is the perception of sound when there is no sound present. And often the sounds are a buzzing or a whooshing or a clicking or a roaring sound, sometimes a single high pitch, sometimes a much broader spectrum of sounds. Tinnitus has no cure at the moment. People are working hard to try and find one. And it's affected by all sorts of things, ranging from exposure to noise, by tiredness, by drugs, alcohol. And it can be very, very distressing. Of course, it affects the way you hear. When you, when you try to hear with tinnitus, you are hearing sounds that are often masking other sounds. And a, a common way of trying to cope with tinnitus is to use external sounds to mask the tinnitus itself. I mean, typically you might use white noise or a, a fan or the sound of rain. These things are all good for helping to mask tinnitus. A couple of other hearing differences I just wanted to mention. Recruitment. This is reduced tolerance of loudness. This tends to accompany um, advanced presbycusis. This is the one where you, you ask someone to speak up, speak up, speak up, and then it becomes too loud. So you say, please stop shouting. So there's a, like a tipping point of loudness. And then amusia is what used to be called tone deaf. And this is the inability to perceive or produce musical sounds. Amusia are pretty rare, actually. People often say I'm tone deaf, but they're not really tone deaf. But nevertheless, it is a real condition, and various people, including Oliver Sacks, have written about it. OK, so that, that's the array of hearing differences that are experienced by one in six of the population. Now, if we move to the right of this diagram, at the top, you'll see a collection of what I call universal variations. And these are things that affect our hearing whatever kind of hearing we have, whether it's normal or different. So, for example, ethnic differences. There, there is prevalence of hearing loss that varies across ethnic groups. This is well documented. Environmental issues, of course, noise exposure, lifestyle. Economic disparities determine your hearing health. Cultural differences, for example, deaf culture has a very advanced understanding of what hearing means to that culture and it is quite different from the rest of culture. I mean, for example, deaf people will often hear through a vibration, so they'll experience hearing as a form of touch. Geographical variations, regional patterns of hearing loss, the, again, these are very well documented. Historical variations, if you read historical literature that discusses hearing, what emerges very clearly is that people heard differently in previous centuries. And then, of course, temporary differences like wax in the ear, viral infections, bacterial or fungal infections. The common cold can change your hearing quite dramatically for a day or two. Tiredness, I expect most people are familiar with that moment when you yawn and suddenly your, your ears clear. That, that is a, a, a piece of aural diversity. And then natural differences, and I've already mentioned these, about the unique shapes of the outer flaps of the ear and indeed some parts of the inner ear for every individual. Now, I'm not going to discuss animal hearing, but you see it's got its own cloud there. But I will say that it is far more diverse, of course, than human hearing. I mean, animals are quite extraordinary in the way that they hear. I mean, the humble pigeon hears infrasound, which endears this animal to me uh, a lot. 
dolphins, rats, horses, cats, dogs, elephants, owls, moths. These are just a few of the species that have very different ways of hearing. But to come back to humans, of course, the other big factor that we have in abundance now is technology. Technology really is creating an enormous aural diversity. Hearing aids, which are obviously the best known and the most common devices, there are various kinds, I won't read them all out, but they really do change the way you hear. I mean, I, my hearing is digitally mediated. So what I'm hearing is a different version of the world from the, the one that I heard before I wore hearing aids. This is even more true for cochlear implants, where you have a surgically implanted neuroprosthesis, which bypasses the acoustic hearing by direct stimulation of the auditory nerve. Cochlear implant wearers often experience initially a period of incomprehension while the sounds are really impossible to understand. And then gradually the brain makes sense of these sounds and your hearing improves. It's important to stress that cochlear implants are not for everybody. They don't always work. So, I mean, most people have seen videos of people having their implants switched on and these sort of joyful moments. Well, that's not necessarily how it is uh, for everybody. And then there are an array of other devices these days, hearables, smart earbuds, assistive listening apps, and so on. And these are all forms of technology that create aural diversity. And I suppose they're all branches in a way of acoustics engineering and of machine listening, machine listening being a computer audition. We talk about computer listening. To what extent a computer can really be said to listen is, is an interesting discussion. But I, no doubt this would affect notions of ubiquitous music. But anyway, it's an important piece of aural diversity. And then finally, in its own little box, uh, little cloud here, the yellow cloud, trained ears. So these are ears that are trained professionally for specific purposes. And obviously musicians are, are one example. We have aural skills, we have hearing training. But it also applies to linguists, to doctors, to engineers and others. Okay, so that, that is the scope of aural diversity. That's mapping out the field of hearing difference. And this is the field in which the project exists. And what we uh, do is to explore the relationships between these differences and their consequences in very many situations, including musical situations. So in music, as in acoustics, as in every other discipline that concerns itself with hearing, there's a tacit assumption of normal hearing. In fact, it's astonishing uh, to me how little uh, the question of hearing is considered when studying music. I, when I studied it at university, there was never any consideration given to the state of hearing, even though at least one person in my year group was deaf. And this kind of underlying tacit assumption is revealed very clearly in this classic work uh, by uh, John Blacking, How Musical is Man, in which he says, we do not know which of man's psychophysical capacities, apart from hearing, are essential for music making, or whether any of them are specific to music. The question in my mind straight away is, well, what about people who can't hear? Are they excluded from music? What about people who hear in a way that is not necessarily recognised as similar to other forms of hearing? Similarly, are they excluded from music? Of course, every musician is familiar with the idea of having a good ear, developing a, a, a trained ear that is capable of detecting things that non-musicians generally would not detect. And this idea of a good ear is so crucial to a musician's career, to their very existence as a musician, that to be seen not to have a good ear is tantamount to career suicide. And this probably explains why 
there is such a suppression or non-acknowledgement of hearing difference in the music industry generally. And yet, paradoxically, because of the nature of music, musicians are four times more likely to develop some kind of hearing condition. Things like tinnitus are more than twice as prevalent among musicians as among the rest of the population. Perhaps surprisingly as well, hyperacusis is also much more common amongst musicians. And this has been well established by a number of surveys. When we come to electroacoustic and digital music and more recent theory, we find this uh, idea of modes of listening cropping up repeatedly. And I'm sure the audience will be familiar with many of these, if not all of them. So Pierre Schaeffer's uh, Quatre Écoutes, Smalley's Nine Indicative Listening Fields, Norman's Referential Listening, Truax's Listening in Search and Listening in Readiness, Clark's Ecological Approach, Oliveros's Deep Listening, Back's Sociological Listening, interesting one, Mullinder's elite level listening of the hostage negotiator, referring to a very specific kind of uh, trained ear. And Kasabian's ubiquitous listening, and that word of course connects to the theme of this conference. What you find when you look at all these theories of listening is that none of them questions the way people hear. They all make an assumption of normal hearing. Even in this area where listening is the most important thing and you would expect there to be an acute awareness of hearing difference, there's still this tacit assumption of an otologically normal listener. And this leads to this quote from Jonathan Stern, sound studies has a creeping normalism to it, an epistemological and political bias towards a normal, non-disabled hearing subject. Now, ubiquitous music talks about its inclusivity and its community-oriented approach to design. I took these quotes from uh, the current call for papers for organised sound concerning ubiquitous music. The integration of musical creativity with expanded and pliable conceptions of sonic activity, listening, embedded embodied interaction and multimodality. It's great to see this and of course I'm excited by the idea that ubiquitous music is accessible. What I would invite people to do is to consider the examples I've given earlier in the discussion of the scope and just think deeply about how accessible it really is. How much of ubiquitous music is accessible, for example, to someone who's profoundly deaf or to someone who's wearing a cochlear implant? If it's not accessible, what can be done to make it accessible? How would you go about adapting the nature of ubiquitous music to make it accessible to those groups of people? How would you distinguish between one hearing type and another? What are the technologies that you would use? How will you measure people's hearing abilities in that context? The Aural Diversity Network has been dealing with exactly these kinds of difficult questions since it started in 2018. We were funded between 21 and 23 by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Before that, we were funded by the Arts Council and also by GN Resound, who are a hearing aid company. The network is ongoing, and if you wish to join the network, uh, it's very simple. You just email info at auraldiversity.org. The network's formed with a core team so myself from Leicester University, David Bagley from Nottingham, Bill Davis from Salford, John Drever from Goldsmiths, Alinka Greasley from Leeds and Josh Rice from Queen Mary's University of London. I should note that very sadly during the course of the 
project, David Bagley died, and he he has not been replaced. So at the moment, the the, the core team is smaller than than uh, I've listed here. But the network itself has been growing steadily, and we have currently 225 formal members. I put a plus sign there because I get new members almost weekly. And then there's probably a wider network that I'd estimate about 200 people who are not actually on the mailing list, but have nevertheless involved themselves in network activities. And we have many, many partnerships with leading organisations and companies from the NHS and the BBC to commercial organisations, people working in acoustics, people working in audiology in particular, music organisations, art centres and so on. We've so far run five workshops as part of the network, the funded network. Before that, we had a conference and two concerts that were very unusual. And we have numerous catch-up events that happen fairly regularly. There's a website and an email list, as I mentioned, and a lot of funding bids in development to build on what we've already achieved. I mentioned the concerts, and an Aral Diversity concert is a very unusual event in the sense that we present many different ways of listening to many different kinds of aurally diverse music. So the musicians are themselves are aurally divergent, and the audience likewise. So, for example, we have vibrating floors so that people can listen in a vibrotactile way. We have video interpretations of the music. We use held objects like balloons um, or just holding on to parts of the room. We use British Sign Language, so signed interpretation, but also integrated into the music itself. We use streaming to headphones and to hearing aids and various other devices and combinations of all the above. And we allow time between each piece for people to adjust how they're going to listen. And the programme is printed almost like a menu in a curry house, indicating how hot <laughs> each curry will be. We show the different character of each of the pieces that people can expect and suggest the best way to listen for the different hearing types. So we try to take account of as many different modes of hearing as we possibly can. Here's a video of the first concert that we did at the old barn on Kelston Round Hill near Bath back in 2019. Oral diversity is a recognition that everybody hears differently. Hearing is unique to every single person. There's not a right or wrong way to hear. We talk about people having hearing loss, hearing impairment. My condition is called hyperacusis and it's considered a medical problem. Is difference a problem? There's a real need for projects which advocate change in the way we deal with the problems that people face when they suffer from hearing difficulties. For the first oral diversity concert, I'm inviting a group of musicians to work together. Each of these musicians has a different hearing profile, ranging from people who have been deaf from birth through to people with, say, acoustic shock, notch losses, people with Meniere's disease. So a whole range of different hearing types. Yeah, we don't have to adapt to music. Maybe music should adapt to us more. It's about the adaptive process of creating music which works for us. That was really exciting for me. The audience can expect a very diverse experience. So there's lots of different types of music and also different ways of listening. So for example, in this concert, we have a vibrating floor. We have remote headphones, so you can listen outside the space. There's also signing, video interpretation. So lots of different ways of approaching and appreciating the music. Without wishing it to sound cliched, I think everybody should experience something like this, because whether you are facing hearing difficulties or whether your hearing is normal, you will be enriched by the experience of this. You will find new ways of thinking about sound 
And I think so many of us who don't have hearing problems, we miss out on a, a great deal because we don't open ourselves up to experiencing sound in other ways. Well, what I'm hoping is that more people will get involved, you know, that this will become a, a, a rolling phenomenon with lots of different people contributing. So that it's not just about me making music, it's about the whole of oral diversity making music. I thought I'd just give you a quick glimpse of some of the commission works, just to give you a flavour of the kind of thing that we do. This first one is a piece, as you can see, by Ed Garland, Josephine Dickinson and J.F. Rosando called Your Awe or Awe or Aura or Audio or Order. And as you can probably work out from the still image on the screen, this is a video piece that involves the three artists writing descriptions of things they're hearing simultaneously together. It's hard to uh, sum this up, but it's quite a hypnotic and uh, beautiful piece. This is a vibrotactile device created by Ricardo Huisman from Amsterdam. And uh, what you can't see here off to the side of the image is Ricardo himself with uh, some sounds on the computer and also playing um, saxophone. But the user is invited to experience the music through this sort of fur-covered bone that uh, conveys the sound through vibration. In some ways, something a bit similar. This is a piece called Undertone. And this involves using a vibrating floor, which is the object that um, you can see myself sitting on there. This is a piece that is all written using very very deep sounds so it's a piece that's felt rather than heard with the ears and here's a piece that uh, I created this work uses an EEG headset which you can see me wearing in the in the bottom right corner this particular project involved three other autistic and deaf musicians the brainwave reader produces a rolling graph of my engagement, excitement, focus, interest, relaxation and stress. And it tags sounds in real time with my responses. So whatever the highest response is at a given moment, that's the tag that the sound gets. And then other people, their reactions similarly tag sounds. So you can start to navigate your way through libraries of sounds that are categorized according to your brain's response. And this allows the unconscious mind to create music in real time, regardless of your hearing ability or your neurological um, state. The network has um, published a book, which is a multi-authored book and contains various essays on various aspects of oral diversity. On the website, there are about 60 odd conference papers and presentations that you can either read or watch. Uh, many of them are video. We commissioned eight artworks and there are many more non-commissioned works that have been presented at concerts and events. We've done public engagement work with the BBC on podcasts and various other media activities. And we can trace the impact of the work that we're doing in a very wide range of disciplines. Essentially, anything that's got hearing involved in it uh, is impacted by these ideas. So acoustics, um, I was at the Institute of Acoustics conference week before last. We've presented at the Noise Consultants Conference, Internoise, which is a massive event, and many other acoustics forums. Architecture, we've worked with Arup to develop an oral diversity toolkit for use by architects. Audiology, I'm working with uh, teams of audiologists in various hospitals looking at uh, ways to improve audiological practice. 
And also, Alenka Griesley has been working with audiologists, particularly through her project Hearing Aids for Music. But we have another project running at the moment called Cadenza, which is very much involved with audiology. Computing, so particularly creative computing, obviously this will be of interest to, to people in the ubiquitous music, but looking at how, how our own diversity affects our approach to computing, and of course design, education, I've got projects in development around particularly working with sonification with autistic students in the context of, say, astronomy. Engineering, how can we model human hearing and how can that be used to calibrate and affect engineering design? Hearing science is fairly obvious. The humanities, we, we've had a kind of ongoing thread about, particularly about literature and history and looking at the ways in which hearing has been described in those fields. Music I've already discussed, psychology is so fairly self-evident, so is soundscape. And we are influencing policy. We've done a project with DEFRA on the extent to which A-weighted decibels are uh, fit for purpose, and the conclusion of that was that they're not. Arup, I've mentioned, the Welsh Government recently put out a, a consultation exercise on soundscape and included a whole section on our old diversity, and we've made a response to that and we're in discussions with the Welsh Government, and so on and so on. So that gives some sense of the scale of the network. I'd like to just conclude by briefly describing my own lived experience, because I think this is relevant, and we methodologically have an approach in the Aral Diversity Network of sharing lived experience. So alongside creative practice, which is part of our research, and more traditional scientific research methodologies, we also encourage what we call, or I call, experts by experience. That's to say, people who have a lived experience that they can share. My own experience with hearing has, has been really quite unusual in the sense that I was autistic uh, without knowing it. I was diagnosed autistic in 2018. And I had many of the features that Bill Davis in his paper on autistic listening identifies as characterising autistic hearing. So an ability to decompose soundscape, what I've called monotropic listening, which is where you focus intensely on detail, and also synesthesia. So in my case, seeing colours with certain sounds. This is fairly common. I think people are probably quite familiar with that idea. And then on top of that, in 2009, I was diagnosed with Meniere's disease, which is a balance disorder. Uh, so I had a lot of vertigo, which was eventually treated successfully, although I no longer have any balance function on my right side as a, re a result of that. But what that has also produced is severe to profound unbalanced hearing loss. Tinnitus, which is constant and varying in intensity, but also in character. And this will often change during the course of a day even. And diplocusis, which is this thing where you hear two different pitches when a piano is played. And in fact, I built a thing called the diplocusis piano, which is an instrument that reproduces what I hear. And then I wrote some pieces for it so that people who do not have diplocusis can understand how I hear the sound of a piano. And my composition recently has dealt a lot with my, my own hearing and my own lived experience. So pieces that, like the BBC Commission Spectrum Sounds, which was in, written in seven different colours for seven different instruments with digital sound. This explored synesthesia, but also explored diplocusis and uh, some aspects of the soundscape decomposition and monotropic listening that I was talking about. So uh, I think that concludes it. Thank you very much for listening. My email address is on screen and please do feel free to contact me if you wish to discuss this any further.